Amen. So good to see everyone here with us this morning. Welcome to New Creation Church. And uh, we're going to get right into the message this morning. The title of my message is, What's God Thinking? What's on His mind? What's He thinking? Last week we celebrated Easter. We celebrated what Jesus did for us in His death, burial, and resurrection. We took some time to look at the, uh, if I can use this word, the ugliness, the darkness, the blackness of uh, our sin and, and why Jesus had to come to this earth. And we, we pointed out how we're all uh, under this, uh, the, we are all born with a sin nature. Romans chapter 3 says we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That puts us all in the same boat, amen? And uh, <laughs> a sinking boat, as, as a matter of fact, if, if we were to stay in that boat. But uh, we, we looked at Ephesians chapter 2 on how we were uh, certain under the powers of darkness. We looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and a whole list of things uh, concerning the way we were. Paul said, and such were some of you. And so we, 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 we described how sometimes you go to a jewelry store and they lay out a black or dark cloth or velvet and then they put that ring on top of that or that watch on top of that and the lights are shining. And so the dark background highlights the beauty of what it is you're looking at. Well, in, in a similar way, God did that for us so we could see just how bad we were. But how many of you know, thankfully, he didn't leave us in that condition? Amen? Because the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The Scripture tells us that we've become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So he made us brand new. So this morning as we talk about what's on his mind, what, what's God thinking, uh, if you're following along with your notes, I, I changed them a little bit this morning before I came in and uh, as I, I reordered them. So kind of go down to the middle, there's another phrase that says what's he thinking or what's God thinking. We're going to kind of go from there down and then we go back up to the top. So anyway, uh, if you're following along in the notes, it'll make more sense to you as we go along. But let's turn together in the book of Romans chapter 1 and begin with verse 16. Romans chapter 1 in verse 16, and I'm going to be reading from the New King James translation. I go between the New King James and I go between the New Living translation. And uh, both are very, very good. There's other uh, great translations too, but I'll be reading from the New King James this morning. So Paul said in Romans chapter 1, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, Paul is writing to a group of people in Rome. Now, if you study the book of Romans, you'll find that his letter was not in response to something they were doing wrong or some error or, or, or lifestyle adjustments they needed to make because there was a problem. He was setting forth some wonderful doctrine. And if you read through the book of Romans, you begin to see, uh, they call it the Roman road when we're witnessing to folks and sharing the gospel with folks. Romans chapter 3 says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 6 tells us that we can, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen? And then he tells us how to get saved in Romans chapter 10, and we're going to uh, talk a little bit about that this morning as well. But notice, he said in verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Everybody say good news. That word gospel means good news. It's not bad news. It's good news. Paul was writing to this, this group of people here in Rome, and you have to understand that the religious leaders of the day had imposed such law and such do's and don'ts upon the people that it was like a weight, it was like a burden, and, and any mention or talking of God was all of these religious things that they had to do to make God accept them. 
it was it was a works. And if you if you, you you know church history, Martin Luther Martin Luther was addressing some things that were happening in the Catholic Church back then uh, of works, where you could only be accepted by God through your own works. And so Martin Luther's reading through the book of Romans, and he begins to see it's grace. It's God's love. It's good news. Everybody say good news again. It's good news. So maybe you were here last week and got saved. Maybe he got saved. That's a a Christian term. Do you know what that means? Got saved. You came into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. How's that? I try not to use too many religious terms or Christianese type terms because there's new folks that come in and you hear words and you go, what does that mean? So we try to explain uh, that word that Donnie had, Donnie Bennett um, talked about, that, that, that's called prophecy, by the way. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14, the Bible talks about gifts of the Spirit and those inspired words that come that's, that's the Holy Spirit dropping into the heart of a man or a woman a, a word to give that would bring comfort or encouragement or uh, upbuilding a person. And that could be for all of us as we receive the word. I believe that's for all of us. But sometimes, specifically, people need to say, that's for me and I receive that, Father. Amen. So those are gifts. Those are things that God does for us to encourage us, to help us, because how many of you know God is for you? He's not against you. So if you were to think, what's what's God thinking? Because there's a lot of times in in the world, uh, there's misconstrued ideas of what God is thinking. So in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the Bible says, Paul's not ashamed of the gospel. This good news was coming. One Bible teacher described the good news as almost too good to be true news. (laughs) <laughs> this is news that, that you know, if, if somebody bought you a lottery ticket and you won the lottery, and I know it's not the same, don't, don't misunderstand, but if, if, if somebody handed you keys to a brand new car that you were, expe- you know, something you really liked or wanted and you just never would buy for yourself and somebody said, you know what, I'm going to buy, there would be a joy, there would be an excitement, there would be a woo. That's what this good news is, because this good news came into a a, a time when people were being beat down. uh, There was a group of Jews in the the religious uh, studies called the Essenes. Am I saying that right? The E-S-S-E-N-E-S, I believe, Essenes. They were a group of people. They had so many regulations and laws that they said they weren't even allowed to have a bowel movement on the Sabbath day. Now, is that ridiculous or what? Isn't it interesting how we try to work our way to God? We try to earn salvation from God. We try to earn the love of God. And friend, I'm here to tell you today, God just loves you. What's God thinking? Well, here's the good news. It's power to everyone who believes it's power it's it's for all it's for all oh no 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 you don't understand pastor i'm bad i've done this i've done that see we we remember we keep in our mind the devil likes to beat us up he's called the accuser of the brethren and he likes to make you think you're a failure you're a low life you're no good and the power of the gospel to everyone who believes the power of God to salvation that word means rescue the greek word there means deliverance it means salvation safety healing there's a whole lot wrapped up in that word we use for salvation God loves you. So this good news came to each and every one of us. Now, go with me to the book of Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, and look at verse 7. Romans chapter 5, and I'm sorry, I'm going to go to verse 17. Romans 5, 17. Now, notice this. What's God thinking? 
Because we've got to get these thoughts in our heart. <clears throat> Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. What's God thinking? Those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, what's God thinking? Will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So maybe you're new to Christianity. Maybe you made a decision to follow Christ last week. Maybe something was stirred in your heart to rededicate your life to the Lord. And, and you may be still thinking, well, God could be mad at me because I wasted this much time. Or God could be mad at me because I did this and I did that. As if he's holding this over your head and, and keeping you under it. Like if you don't shape up and you don't walk this narrow little line, and I do understand this. Scripture says, wide is the way that leads to destruction and narrow the way to life in, in Christ and in the kingdom. There is a certain way to walk. I understand that. But sometimes people live under a condemnation. They're never good enough. They live under a condemnation. They'll never uh, do enough to make God love them. Friend, God just loves you. Just the way you are. He loves you. He reaches out to you. And he wants to receive you. And notice the Bible says here, he wants to help you reign in life. Reign. R-E-I-G-N. Reign. That's like a king would reign. That's like a king would rule. That's the picture you need to get. You don't need to get a picture of victim in your mind. You need to get a picture of victor in your mind. See, the, there, there's a difference. And in, 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 in things that happen in life cause people to wonder what God is thinking or what God is doing. Well, we want to look at some of these things. The gospel comes to bring help. God says that if you receive the gift of grace or the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, you'll reign in life through. Everybody say through Christ. So he wants you, the scripture says, even in the Old Testament, to be the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath. He wants everything you set your hand to to prosper. Those are the, that's part of the good news Hallelujah. Now, go with me real quick to the book of Romans again. We're still in the book of Romans, chapter 8, and look at verse 37. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. What's he thinking? What's God thinking? Well, God is thinking is, or let me say it this way, what God is thinking is revealed through his word. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that God has spoken to us in these last days by His Son. So you see, when Jesus Christ came to this earth, there were things He said, there were things He did, and He said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. So there are things about the life of Christ that we need instead of allowing experiences. How many of you know, not every experience you have not every experience you encounter or see in someone else's life is necessarily the will or the plan of God. And sometimes we let experience. Here's an example. Oh, well, we prayed and it didn't happen, so it must not have been the will of God. People think that. We prayed, it didn't happen, so it must not have been the will of God. No, maybe you weren't believing you received when you prayed. We we're studying that in, in our healing class on Wednesday night. The first Wednesday night of each month, we're going to teach on healing. And I unloaded an hour and 15 minutes worth of teaching on healing. I was like, I think I went a little too long. Anyway, it seemed to go pretty quick. And people hung around afterwards. So I guess it wasn't too bad. But I... I, I, I you know, you start out in healing and you think, well, exactly where do we begin? And so we, we were talking about, first of all, how good God is and, and not basing things that we believe about God on experience. We have to base it on the Bible. We have to base it on the words of Jesus Christ. The scripture says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. It says he's the exact image of God. 
So when we see Jesus, we see God. So sometimes experiences happen that we may not understand. We just set those back on the shelf, say, you know what, I'm not quite sure what happened there, but I know God is good, and I know God answers prayer. Mark 11:24 24 is what we're looking to get to on our healing school, and that is believe you receive when you pray, and you will have, right? So how do you get to that place? Sometimes I think people pray and hope they receive. Sometimes people pray, well, let's just see if this works. And if it doesn't work, then they say, well, it must not have been the will of God. No, maybe you weren't positioned. Maybe you weren't believing. Hallelujah. Now, you're not working to earn anything from God, but faith, what it does is it puts us in a position to receive what he's already given. Hallelujah. So, in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, notice the scripture says, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors. What, what is God thinking? Yet in all these things, we are, well, what, what things? So you can go back a couple of verses, go back to verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? Paul went through all of that. Paul was shipwrecked, Paul was beaten. Paul stood before a king, and he said, I count myself a happy man. And there he is standing in chains. He'd been beaten, he'd been whipped, he'd been stoned, left for dead, been bitten by snakes, vipers. I'm a happy man. How could he be happy? Because he knew who he was in Christ. Amen? He had that expectation. That expectation brought joy. That expectation brought peace. He had an expectation and an understanding of what God is thinking. What's God thinking? Persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we're killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Notice the, the, the things that Paul went through were persecution for preaching and teaching the gospel. Some of you are being persecuted in your jobs because you take a stand for Christ. Some of you are being persecuted in your family. God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's with you. He's there to help you. And then he says, after all those things, for the, your sake, we're killed all the day long, accounted for sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things... We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Hallelujah. You're more than a conqueror. And, and I don't know of any other better illustration to use of more than a conqueror than this one right here. You say, what is more than a conqueror? More than a conqueror is the picture we have of a boxer that goes into the ring. And that boxer gets the, the snot beat out of him for however many rounds. Finally, the boxer wins over his opponent. Maybe he has a knockout, knocks out his other opponent after he's gone however many rounds and he's bleeding a little bit, got a swollen eye, a swollen lip, maybe his nose is a little out of joint. He wins. He conquered. They give him the big belt. They walk around with the big check and they give him the check because he's the conqueror. Who's more than the conqueror? Some of you know the end of the story. His wife. He goes home and hands the check to his wife. She's more than a conqueror. That's the picture you need to have. Jesus went to the grave. Jesus went to the cross. He was whipped. He was beaten. He suffered. He sacrificed in your place and in my place. And when God said justice has been fulfilled and raised Jesus Christ from the dead and seated us with him in heavenly places, he made you more than a conqueror. You got to get rid of that victim mindset. You got to get rid of that victim mindset. Oh, they did this to me, and she did that to me, and he did that to me, and I, I don't belittle the pain. I don't belittle what you've been through. But don't stay there. Renew your mind to see who God sees you. What's he thinking? 
he's thinking you're more than a conqueror through Christ who loved you. He's thinking you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He's thinking this is good news. Would you receive it? Hallelujah. So what do you do with this news? What, 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 what do we do with it? Jeremiah 29, 11, what's he thinking? I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. What's he thinking? Good thoughts. He's got good thoughts to you. Have you read Psalm 139 lately? Maybe if you're struggling in some areas, you just need to go back to Psalm 139 and read Psalm 139. And notice how he thinks thoughts towards you. They're good thoughts that far outnumber the sand on the seashores. Maybe, maybe you're new to Christianity and you're struggling. Maybe you're new to a relationship with him and, and you just wonder, what's he thinking? Because, you know, so-and-so served him and this happened to them and this bad thing happened and that happened and that maybe maybe... Job, oh, Job, because maybe, I don't know how it is that people always hear about Job, <clears throat> but they never talk about the end of Job much, do they? And I've heard that the, the, the time period that Job lost everything and then be, as he was getting it all back again was like nine months. I, I don't know that for a fact, but did you ever see the end of Job? The end of Job, God blessed him abundantly. Why do we focus on all the stuff that he went through as, as if that was the end some people have a victim mindset. You get out of that victim mindset. You're a victor through Christ. Amen. You are victorious through Christ. What's God thinking? I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. He's thinking thoughts of peace to you, not of evil. He's thinking he wants to give you a future and a hope. Your situation, the, the place you see yourself right now might look hopeless. But hold fast to the confession of your faith. Renew your mind to think like God thinks. Because, friend, whether we like to think about this or not or, or agree with this or not, we have a choice in the matter. Amen. So let's look at a couple of scriptures. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. The New King James says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before your pastor. I've set before your husband. I've set before your wife. I've set before your doctor. I've set before your financial advisor. Mm -mm. Does it say that? No, it says I've set before who? You. Say you is me. <laughs> the you here is me. I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you that I've set before you. You could say I, God has set before me life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Well, no, no, no. See, it's all up to God. No, God just said here in his word, he sets before us life and death, blessing and cursing. He says, and I love this because you've heard people say this before, but this is like an open book test and God gives you the answer. He even makes it easier. It's an open book test, but he tells you, you have a choice, life or death. Choose life. Choose life. He tells you the answer. Therefore, choose life. That both you and your descendants shall live. So here's a fundamental truth, a fundamental thought that God has. What's he thinking? A fundamental thought is God wants us to live in victory through what Jesus Christ has done for us in his death, burial, and resurrection. Hallelujah. Look at John 16, 33. Let's just go through some of these scriptures that'll Build this understanding in our hearts. He wants you to understand you are more than a conqueror. You don't feel like it. I don't feel like more than a conqueror. 
Pastor, you don't know my situation. You don't know my circumstance. And I might not. I don't know every single one of you. I don't know exactly what you're going through. But God knows. The Lord Jesus Christ knows. And he says, you can do something about it. You don't have to just sit there and kind of wait. Well, if, if things get better, it must be because God wanted them better. And if things don't get better, it must not mean God wanted them better. Now, we have to understand, what's he thinking Jesus said in John 16, these things have I spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So he doesn't say that the Christian life is, a, is, is floating down a river on a flowery bed of ease, floating through life without any struggle, any challenge. How many of you know there's an enemy? If you're more than a conqueror, that means there's an enemy. But how many of you know Jesus defeated the enemy? And since he defeated the enemy, you're in him. That makes you more than a conqueror. So the enemy may try to bring things to you, try to bring circumstances and situations into your life. And God says, I've done what I need to do to stop the work of the enemy through you. You stand through Christ. You resist the enemy. We're going to look at some of those scriptures in just a moment. So walking in victory means living in Christ and the authority that he's given to us. He defeated the devil when he died on the cross, paying the price for our sin, went to hell, and when justice was fulfilled, God raised him from the dead victorious. And in God's mind, oh, oh, read Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 is so good. Maybe the reason Romans is so, so strong in my heart and mind this morning is in our Bible school, we were just teaching on the book of Romans going through the book of Romans and Paul's teaching, Paul's revelation. I think it was Pastor Mark Hankins said this, that Paul said the things that Jesus couldn't say when he was on this earth. Remember what Jesus said, there are things I want to tell you, but you're just not at a place where you can receive them yet. And so when God called Paul into the ministry, God gave him the words that Jesus couldn't say while he was on the earth because he hadn't been crucified he hasn't been resurrected from the dead the holy spirit hadn't been poured out and so paul taught us and showed us what happened he showed us we talked about this last week he showed us what happened to jesus christ from the time he went into the grave until the time he was raised up in the epistles we get the picture uh, some have called it the x-ray to see what jesus did and the whole purpose of him coming to this earth was not only to make us sons and daughters of God so we could enjoy relationship with God, but to put us in a place, as it said in Romans chapter 5, to reign as kings in life by the one Jesus Christ. He wants you to reign. You go back and you think about how God created Adam and Eve. And how God gave dominion, God gave authority to Adam and Eve and the earth. What happened? They transferred that authority to the devil because they disobeyed God. But God didn't just say, oh, that's it, you're doomed. <laughs> he said, I have a plan. Jesus will become a man and he will die to pay the price of your mistake, the price of your sin. And now through him, you can reign. Through him, you can be victorious. Through him, you can be more than a conqueror. Hallelujah. If he's not, if that's not first and foremost in our thoughts, we need to renew our mind to think and begin to think like God thinks of us. We have to know that God is for us. He's not against us. He's not the guy beating you up. He's not the guy putting you through the trials and the circumstances uh, that you're going through. God is for you. Hallelujah. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. But then he talks about, and 
the, she, the, the thief. He actually starts with the thief. I started with the good shepherd part, just so you could see what God is like, so you could see who Jesus is like. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. The thief's purpose is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Wow. Say, God is for me. He's not against me. Amen. Now, you have to understand, sometimes people make decisions that aren't good, that may affect you. You didn't make that decision, but someone else made a decision and it affected you. But did you know that you can still be more than a conqueror in a situation that somebody else may have caused? Amen. The enemy may have worked through another person or another circumstance or another situation, but that doesn't mean you just sit back in life and go, well, I guess this is just the way it has to be. No, you find out what God's thinking and say, wait a minute, I'm more than a conqueror. He's for me. He's not against me. I'm to rule and to reign in life through Jesus Christ. Wow. So what we have to understand is there are two views uh, in Christianity and in theology, religion, if I can use that word. I don't like that uh, word because when we talk about our relationship with God, it's not religion, it's relationship. But there are two main views. One is that God dominates the human will and makes you do what you do and nothing or, or everything in life is nothing more than a reflection of the sovereign will of God. So here's one view. God dominates the human will. He makes you do what you do, and everything in life is nothing more than a reflection of the sovereign will of God. God willed that to happen. God wanted that to happen. God made that happen. God imposes upon your life what his will is with no regard to what your will is. So that's one view. God dominates the human will. The other view is that man is a free moral agent. Man has a choice. This view says God is sovereign. God has the final word. He is the final authority. No one tells God what to do. Okay? Man is a free moral agent. Man has a choice. This view says God is sovereign. He has the final word. He has or is the final authority. No one tells God what to do. Free choice is recognizing who God is and that he is the final authority. And he chose to give you and me a choice. You have a choice. If, if God was dominating the human will, why did he let Adam and Eve choose to disobey him in the garden? You have a free will. You are a free moral agent. God didn't make you a robot. He gave you the ability to choose. If he didn't give us a choice, why did Jesus tell us to speak to mountains and situations that come against us? So if, if, if something's come against your life, Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, verse 22, have faith in God. He said, I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. But you must believe that it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. So he said, there's verse 24, I tell you, you can pray for anything. Now, when he says you can pray for anything, how many of you know what you pray for has to line up with the Bible? Jesus, didn't the word of God tell us that you can ask what you will? But he's, he's making these comments. He talks about uh, abiding in the word and letting the word abide in you. And you can ask what you will and you will receive. There's a foundation. We can't ask. Sometimes you hear stories. You hear stories of people that say, uh, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a single lady or a single guy. Let's just pick on the guys for a second. Maybe it's a single guy, and he sees this other lady. Maybe she's married, and he says, you know, the Bible says I can have whatever I say. She's going to be my wife. She's going to get a divorce or... 
whatever. You can't, that's not, you can't pray and receive against the word of God. The word of God doesn't say that's your place, your authority. But if sickness or disease comes against you, you can say, wait a minute. Here's what the Bible says. Jesus bore my sin. Jesus bore my sickness and my disease. And by his stripes, I am healed. That's what he's talking about. So when the Bible says you can pray for anything, if you believe you've received it, it has to line up with the word of God. So find out what the Bible says is yours and pray that and receive that because he wants you to have it. Maybe you're struggling with peace. How many of you know you can pray and say, Lord, I just thank you for your peace. Thank you for the peace of God that passes all understanding. It guards my heart and my mind. That's scripture. You can pray that because it's in the word. So if you were not a free moral agent, if God was controlling everything, why did he tell you to speak to your mountain? He wouldn't have told you to speak to your mountain if you couldn't do something about the mountain that was in your way. The mountain is a challenge. The mountain is something that comes to block. The mountain that comes is something that hinders. If you were not a free moral agent, why would Jesus say, you talk to your problem and it'll be cast into the sea? He gave you that authority. If everything were up to God, why did he tell us to resist the devil and that he would flee from us, right? In James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, the Bible says, So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. So what does he say? He says, resist the devil. If... God was sovereign and everything was happening because God wanted it to happen. Why would he tell you and me to resist the devil? So when you see something that comes against you that does not line up with the word of God, you say, well, wait a minute. Fear, get out of here in Jesus' name, right? Sickness, take your hands off of my family in Jesus' name. Poverty, lack, Jesus died to redeem us from the curse of the law. Under the curse of the law was spiritual death. Under the curse of the law was sickness and disease. Under the curse of the law was physical attack. All those kinds of things came under the curse of the law. The Bible says Jesus came to redeem us from the curse of the law. But what's happening in Christian realms today is that people are taking the position of just kind of sitting back with the thought that God is in control of everything and we can't do anything. But when you begin to read the scripture, you see that he said, you resist the devil and he'll flee from you. What's God thinking? Wow. His thoughts towards you are good. They're not of evil. They're to give you a hope and a future. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, in the New Century Version, says it this way, but thanks be to God who always leads us in victory through Christ. And God uses us to spread his knowledge everywhere like a sweet-smelling perfume so what's God thinking what's on his mind on his mind God's thoughts toward you are victory God's thoughts toward you are he loves you and he has a good plan and a good purpose for your life if you're new to this relationship with Christ, again, I point back to Easter and the celebration. Maybe someone invited you to church. Maybe you went to church somewhere else and today you find yourself here. You're, you're, you're seeking more of God. You are not here by accident. God wanted you to hear these words. Maybe you've walked with him for years. God wants you to be reminded today. He's for you. He's not against you. Amen. Amen. You need to think like a victor, not like a victim. Amen? Now, what else? This is very, very important. There's something else on God's mind. 
It's what he did for you and for me in Christ to bring us into relationship with him and to make us rule and reign on this earth to restore to us the authority of the original creation, the authority when he put Adam and Eve in the garden. Jesus came to give that back to you and to me. That's what he's thinking for you as a believer. But how many of you know there's still some folks that are on his mind? In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that I've given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Wow. I want us to watch this real quick little video. Then I'm going to come back, make a comment or two, and then we'll close. Last week was Easter. The day Jesus rose from the grave. The day hope was restored. And eternity was changed forever. Today is a new day. A day with a mission, a day with a calling to go, to make disciples, to make a difference, to share the hope of Easter everywhere. Jesus rose from the grave, but the world will never know unless we tell them. Easter is over, but our commission is clear. Let's go. Hallelujah. What's he thinking? What's God thinking? You can tell someone in the world what he's done for you because you know you're a victor, not a victim. Amen? The scripture says, in James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the latter or the early and the latter rain. You also, also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. What does he call the lost? This picture is the precious fruit of the earth. He's not just talking about corn and wheat and cucumbers and tomatoes and he's not just talking about natural harvest he's talking about life people's lives so he's thinking good thoughts towards you and me because we're already in the family of God we're already children of God he's wanting to help us understand we're seated with Christ in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might Every ruler, every name, every dominion, every power of darkness. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we're seated with Christ. Romans chapter 8, we're more than a conqueror. But he also is thinking about the precious fruit of the earth. He's thinking about others who don't yet know Jesus Christ. And he's saying to us, we need to go. He wants us to partner with him. Let's all stand up together. Father, thank you so much that you have good thoughts toward each and every one of us in this room, those watching, those listening, that, Lord, your presence right now. I think, thank you, Father, that whatever circumstance or situation, obviously in a time that we have together this morning, we, we can't go into every area of life and share Scripture but Lord, I thank you that the Holy Spirit right now can minister to those listening. Bring to their remembrance passages, verses, references of your will concerning the situation that they find themselves in. If it's worry and anxiousness, Lord, I thank you for Philippians chapter 4 that comes to mind. If it's fear, Lord, I thank you 
for 2 Timothy that comes to mind, that you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Oh, Father, if it's anger issues, if it's, if it's sin, if it's temptation, thank you for the word that comes that you've made us overcomers. And we can conquer through Christ any circumstance and situation that comes our way. Thank you, Lord, for your love to us. And Lord, may we, as we go from this place today, not forget those who may not yet know you. Help us to remember you've made us victors, not victims. You're, we're more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. And we thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.